Hey, what's up, Scott Balkan here with Imagination Creation Films, and today we're tackling part one of our data storage for filmmakers series. Buckle up, we're gonna be going through quite a bit. Yeah. Well, this is a multi-part series, so please try not to skip over everything. It's well worth your time, and also, now's a great time to go ahead and click subscribe and the alert bell so you don't miss a thing, like, the next episode. So no matter where you are in your film career, eventually you're gonna hit one large barrier, storage. In this series of videos, I'm gonna be going over several options for filmmakers that tackle the variety of needs we have. From large amounts of data with many active users to small amounts with the highest in protection, there's a solution that will work for you. Now we're gonna be going over several different types of storage and explain a little bit about each the pros, the cons, the gotchas, and the why you should use this one over that one, etc. Now there are no hard and fast rules in storage except for two. Redundancy is not a backup and you should always have a backup. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. Now listen, I know people have limited time and the too long didn't read philosophy really makes people wanna stop watching and do something else, but if you're fighting storage problems, you need to pay attention here to this entire series. Set aside some time and consume this. It will save you 10 times as much time and money later through avoiding inefficiencies and problems. If you're a too long didn't read this video person and just go to the comments to find out what I recommend, you're gonna be quickly upset at what you thought you were gonna get versus what you got. Now, many of us starting out use external drives to store our data, and if we're really concerned about it, we copy it to another drive. Now, we know working from an external spinning drive can be quite slow at about 150 megabytes a second, and then some of us are using SSDs, which are a little bit faster, and then there are some using NVMe, which is much, much faster, but oddly, we find as the speed increases, the cost does too, and the capacity drops as well. Now, we're kind of comparing like an eight terabyte NVMe for about 12 to $1,500 versus a eight terabyte hard drive for 110 to $150. We're talking a thousand percent difference in price. So most people buy the spinning hard drives, oddly enough. And now at some point in your film career, you're gonna fill up those drives. And well, that's where a storage array comes in or a NAS. Now this can be a starting point for some as well if you're just jumping in full force. If you have lots of data already, then well, an array is where we begin. And this is the point where things can get confusing. Now math, it's very important here, and I'll try to explain a little of the math as we go. So, if you have more than one drive in an enclosure, you'll likely want to configure it as some type of RAID, and RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. Now, what it means is the individual drives work as a team to perform as they're configured. Now there are many RAID types and each one has pros and cons. Let's start with the basics. Let's say you have 10 terabyte drives. These drives have a maximum throughput of 150 megabytes a second. And let's say you have an enclosure with eight of these drives. Now, you could potentially configure them in various ways. First, JBOD or just a bunch of disks. With eight drives in JBOD, your operating system is going to see eight individual drives, and the data speed can't exceed about 150 megabytes. It's because there's eight independent disks. If a single drive fails, well, anything written to that one drive is lost forever. JBOD offers no performance increase and no redundancy. Next, we start working in RAID. And RAID zero is where we start. Now, this is where we're gonna start doing math. And I'll try to keep it as simple as possible so you can understand the concepts without getting too detailed. 
Now, the way a RAID 0 works is by striping data across eight drives. Now, there are eight bits in a byte of data. Each bit is either a one or a zero, and one being odd, even being zero. The RAID controller, either hardware or software in these days, it'll write one bit to each drive in order and then continue writing all data. Now, I'm being extremely simplistic here. It doesn't actually write one bit at a time. It can write anywhere from 512 bits to 1,024 kilobytes, depending on how you have it configured. But we're being simplistic so everyone can follow the math and the math scales. So now we're writing to eight different drives at the same time. So you effectively get a massive increase in speed. So by writing these eight bits across the eight drives, you can write them all at the exact same time. Now I'm going to use the term effectively because it doesn't scale absolutely. And there are still a lot of factors that can create a bottleneck, but effectively, you can read and write to the eight drives together at a rate of eight times 150 megabytes a second or 1.2 gigabytes a second. Now, I know I said two conflicting things. It does scale, but there is a diminishing return uh, where, where uh, technologies will share. That's when it doesn't scale perfectly. But for eight, it's, it's going to scale fairly close. Now you also have eight 10 terabyte drives of storage for a total of 80 terabytes. Now you have extreme speed and you have maximum storage space, but you have no redundancy. If one drive fails, you won't just lose the drive, you will lose all of the data on all of the drives because Eight bits are required to make a full byte. If a single drive failed, you're missing one of the bits. Therefore, you can't read any of the data because it's incomplete. Now, there is a huge, huge risk with RAID 0. And honestly, it's just not worth it. I hear people all the time say, yeah, but it's worked so far and, 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 and I'll get away with it. And it's not that important. Drives do fail. And it isn't that often, but it does happen. But there are other types of failure too. Ones that you may not immediately notice. So on each drive, there are sectors and sectors fail quite often. Generally, a drive will go out and mark a sector as bad if it determines that I can't write to it and it'll never use it again. But any data that was written to that sector, it's lost forever. And because you're striped across all drives, it's companion data. The other seven bits on the other seven drives, that data is now incomplete. So losing one bit on a single sector, on a single drive, could cause an entire file to be corrupt, or worse, many files. Again, it's a huge risk. The next RAID level we're gonna talk about is RAID 1, and it has a companion RAID 10, or RAID 1 plus 0. I'll explain. RAID 1 works as a pair of drives. Now this is called mirroring and it works like this. Every bit you write to one drive, the same bit is written to its companion drive. So all eight bits are written to drive one and at the same time, the same eight bits are written to drive two. Now, effectively, you are writing the same data to two drives at the same time. So your write speeds will never reach over 150 megabytes a second. Now, on some hardware and even some software, 
It may even cut those write speeds in half due to how the controller handles writes and the cues. But for the most part, you're probably okay. When you read on some arrays, it can actually read from both drives at the same time because they have the same data. So it can read eight bits from this drive and then read the next eight bits from the companion drive at the same time, giving you twice the read speed of about 300 megabytes a second. On some controllers, it can only read from one. So that speed is back to 150 megabytes a second. So your total disk space will only actually be 10 terabytes, but you'll be consuming 20 terabytes of raw space. Now, you have a high level of redundancy. If you lose a drive or even a sector, its companion has an identical copy of the data. So the data maintains its integrity. You gain high availability, but you lose the performance and the capacity. Now, let's add in the RAID 1.0 or 1 plus 0 or RAID 10. Since RAID 1 only works with pairs of drives, well, you, you have the eight drives that we've been talking about previously. You can possibly configure a RAID 10, which is four mirrored pairs and then stripe across the four pairs. So you would have a mirror pair, a mirror pair, a mirror pair, and a mirror pair. You, and then it would just create a RAID zero across those mirrored pairs. You get the same effect, you get the same result. And now you start getting the best of both worlds. Your write speed could be as high as four times 150 megabytes a second or 600 megabytes a second. And your read speed could be as high as 1200 megabytes a second or 1.2 gigabytes a second. Now, in most cases, I believe you'll be at about 600 megabytes per second in each direction. In this example, you can lose up to four of those drives and not lose any data. Now, the caveat to that is those drives would need to fail on only one side of the mirror. Meaning if you have a RAID zero set of four here and a RAID zero set of four here, you can lose these four, but you cannot lose this drive, this drive, this drive, and this drive. Then you lose everything. Same thing with the mirrored pair. You cannot lose its companion. You would then lose all data on all drives. It's extremely rare for two drives to fail at the same time or even near the same time, but it can and does happen. And it's even more rare for the two drives to fail on the same mirrored pair. But we're playing with percentages and it's important for you to quantify your risk. And keep in mind, though, that if you lose one drive and there's a bad sector on its mirrored pair or on any other striped RAID zero, you could still lose some data. And in the end, you end up with 40 terabytes of usable space, consuming 80 terabytes of raw space. Now, the next part is where the math really starts to come into play. RAID 5. Now, this is a data stripe with parity. Now, let me explain how this works. For RAID 5, you need a minimum of three disks, but I'm going to use our example of eight to show the math. Now, we need to write eight bits out to create one byte. If you recall, a bit is either a one or a zero, or odd or even. So it starts writing out one bit per drive, and it skips the last drive. It then continues read to the next level. It then does a calculation of those bits that were written, and it writes on the parity drive either a one or a zero. 
All it's doing is it's adding up the ones and the zeros in that row. And if it equals an even number, it writes a zero. If it is an odd number, it writes a one. So it's only written the seven bits of the eight bits of data, so it writes that eighth bit on drive number one, and then it continues on, and it kind of gets a little offset. But either way, it's always skipping the one drive, and that is your, it's your answer key. Now, if you lose a drive, the controller can calculate the missing bits. All it needs to do is read the line of bits that it has written and compare to the parity answer. And it's basically algebra. If the remaining bits equals even, but the parity answer says the whole sum should be odd, then you know the missing bit is actually a one. If the parity answer was even, then we're missing a zero. So it can't read that data immediately from the drives as, as if all the data was there. It has to do the calculation in real time as it reads. Now, this comes at a cost of only one drive. So you're gonna get 70 terabytes of storage out of your 80 terabytes, but you also get a little over one gigabyte a second of read speed and a little less write speed because of the calculation it has to do on the right for the parity. Now, if you were to lose a single drive, the read speed would slow down to whatever the calculated parity speed is, and that depends on the either the processor on your software RAID or the processor, the CPU that's on your hardware RAID. But your data is safe, even down to the sector and it only costs you one drive. You could be 100% safe again, as long as you replace that one failed drive ASAP. Now, there is a rebuild process that does take some time. And it's basically running the math on every single bit across the entire stripe and writing all that data back to the, the new drive. And during this time, if you were to lose one sector, you could lose data. If you lose one more drive before it's rebuilt, you could lose all the drives. RAID 5 has a maximum number of drives that it can support, and it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. Now, that number is, it's based on the controller, um, but there is another RAID level that allows you to expand upon RAID 5. And you might have figured it out, it's RAID 50 or RAID 5 plus zero. It's essentially a RAID zero set of two RAID 5 sets. So we have a set of eight drives of the parity, another set of eight drives of the parity, and it writes across all of them. So you stacked your RAIDs. But we don't need to go into that one too, too far into this. Just know that we can essentially stack RAID levels to gain additional abilities at additional costs. Now, the next level of RAID is RAID 6. And this works exactly like RAID 5, except instead of one parity drive, we have two parity drives. So you get 60 terabytes of usable space in 80 terabytes of raw space. But now you can lose two drives before losing all of your data. Now in RAID 6, you're going to get around 900 megabytes per second read speed and about 500 megabytes write speed. It'll vary, but that's kind of the, the baselines there. Um, it depends on the controller and the software and or the hardware and its ability to handle the data. Um, RAID 6 can then also be stacked or expanded to RAID 60 or RAID 6 plus zero. Now, 
There are many other types of RAID, but these are the ones that are, well, the most useful to our video work. Now, take a breath, especially me. That was a lot to go through just to explain a few simple points. But these details are what leads to so much confusion about performance and redundancy. Now, I've seen some buy like a four bay drive array and wonder why they can't get a gigabyte a second out of it. Or others don't understand why they have 20 terabytes of drives in their RAID 1, but they only get to see 10 terabytes. Now, there's some other redundancy types that we'll be discussing in the individual configuration videos, but that'll be in the future. This concludes part one of the series. Part two will explain connection types and connections as it relates to drive speeds and actual capacity for our video use. And if you have any questions about the RAID types or anything we discuss, please drop a comment down below and I'll try to answer them. Then we'll be diving much, much deeper in the next few videos. So if your question isn't about a RAID type, just wait for the next video and it's likely going to be answered. And if you'd like to support this channel or purchase any of the gear we talk about, please use one of the affiliate links down below. It really, really helps the channel. Also consider subscribing and joining the channel as a channel member. It's another great way to help support and be a part of the community. And as always, as I like to leave it, don't let your passions center around your life, let your life center around your passions.